Welcome back to another episode of Taking Control of Cancer, the podcast brought to you by the North East London Cancer Alliance. I'm Steve Bland and in this podcast we try and give you a bit of a how-to guide to help you overcome common myths, fears and barriers to cancer prevention, diagnosis, treatment and care. We want to provide both patients and healthcare professionals with tangible things that they can do when it comes to cancer and while we know that not all cancers are preventable there are things that we can all do that can make a real positive difference to the health and well-being of not only ourselves but our family our friends and our colleagues now in this episode i'm joined by the managing director of the northeast cancer alliance femi odawali and we're talking about cancer in bame communities uh, with a focus specifically on breast cancer because breast cancer is actually the most common cancer uh, here in North East London. Our guest is Pamela Ochere. Now, Pamela uh, has her own experience of breast cancer, but she's also an ambassador for the amazing uh, group at Black Women Rising. And we'll get into all of that with Pamela in this podcast. So, uh, without further ado, uh, this is Pamela. So, um, I was um, diagnosed at the age of 38 with uh, breast cancer in my right breast. Um, it was a grade three, um, HER2 positive. Um, I'm a single mom of two boys. And um, yeah, it's actually my youngest son that actually um, made me discover the lump because um, we were um, play fighting and um, he accidentally hit my right breast. And while I was lying down, that's where I discovered the lump. Wow. Um, so at that time, um, I was working as a, a teaching assistant at school. And really strangely, I didn't really think anything of it. I, I really thought it was a benign, so it, it will go away. I didn't even think that cancer could be an option for me because of my age. But um, still something in me asked one of the teachers if, if I should get it checked. And she said, definitely. Um, go out the back and just call the GP now and um, because it was um, I was diagnosed in June 21 we were still in the height of um, COVID regulations and um, my GP was really good he basically said come in the next day and we'll we'll check it out and um, I did go the next day and I got examined and got told that um, I'm going to be referred to the hospital just for just for checkup, just for checkup. So I um, went to the rapid diagnostic um, center where I had uh, a consultation. Got told immediately that um, it was definitely not a benign. So I needed an ultrasound. So I went to the next room, had an ultrasound, and got told it's, it's looking very suspicious. So you need a mammogram. So then I went to the next room, had a mammogram done, and there they confirmed that it, it most likely is cancerous. But we're still not sure, so let's have a biopsy. So I went to the next room, had a biopsy done, and then um, in the end got told on the same day that I had cancer. On the same day? On the, the same day. The first day that you went in to get yes. your initial scan, yes. you had all of the tests all done? All done. On the same we were day. told straight away. Um, just just uh, row back a couple of steps. You said you said that when you first found the lump, you thought to yourself, "There's no way that can be cancer." And you mentioned your age. Just expand on that a little bit. What was your kind of perception of, you know, who got cancer, uh, who got breast cancer? Because in my area where I am, in fa- in family, um, no one in my family has got cancer. And my perception was if someone in your family has cancer, there's the probability of you, you, you getting cancer as well. And also it's not much talked in my community at all. So the thought of having it was, was absolutely not in my mind. And that's not because it doesn't exist there. It just, it's not something people talk about. No, we don't talk about it at all. Also me being a single mom, I, I'm, I was on like a hamster wheel. I would yeah. work, look after the kids, come home, and you know, eat, sleep, repeat type of 
living. So even having cancer in there would not would not be something that I would be even thinking about having. So it was it was dismissive of even thinking that cancer could be a possibility. And also, yeah, it wasn't something I, I felt like I was also too young to have it because that was the perception. But still something in me thought I still need to ask someone because I need that validation to get it checked, even though I am certain it's not cancer. But it ended I up think, being it. I think Femi, that's one of that's one of the things we come across time and time again, isn't it, with mm. all different kinds of cancers. It can't be me. I'm the wrong I'm the wrong yeah. age. You know, I'm from the wrong community. I'm you know, my life situation, whatever it is, isn't the right one. Bowel cancer here all the time. You know, we're told that it's, you know, middle aged men who drink too much red wine and all that mm. kind of thing. And then, you know, a young woman might get bowel cancer and think, Oh, it can't you know, it can't be bowel cancer. Mm. And I think it's it is so much of, you know, this podcast and, and other work that people do and you guys do with the alliance is breaking down those, you know, perceptions and actually saying anybody can get cancer. You know, there is it is so indiscriminate. No, absolutely I think that's a perfect point. I mean, even me when I started, um, I've worked in the NHS for almost 20 years. And even when I started, um, and I started to work in cancer, I worked in surgery and worked in cancer and dealt with cancer a lot more, even though I manage kind of surgical cancer specialist, uh, specialities. Um, one of the key things I started to do, especially when I started managing oncology services, is that I had to go to things like mortality meetings and, you know, where we reviewed cases, where the clinicians reviewed cases, um, post-treatment where a patient has died X amount of time after. And they just tried to explore whether or not, um, you know, some of the, the treatments that they gave them um, contributed or helped or, you know, just an evaluation of, of that yeah. patient's um, case. And I remember um, joining um, one of these review meetings. And then and I was doing it every other week and every other month and so on and so forth. And you started to see that the topics, I would also say the not topic, the, the patient age, because they'll give a profile, you know how a consultant will dictate and they will give a profile of the patient. Um, and when they start to provide a profile, you will start seeing that there was a lot of young people there as well. And which even for me was something that was like, hold on a second. I actually thought this was an older person's, um, if that's the right word to say, it was an older, yeah. it was seen yeah. before as an older person's disease. You know, it's much older people that get it. And the more you look at that, the more you start to see that, oh my God, anybody can get cancer. So I completely that really resonates and actually even me you know even working in cancer until you start seeing more of those cases you, you know you start to realize oh my god there's no you know there's nobody that could be spared from this it's yeah. it's any it's anybody um and then the, the the other point that you made around culture again something i'm quite familiar with as well which is again growing up as a nigerian as a nigerian in the uk uk nigerian it's not something that family ever really spoke of and if you did have any or you know uncles or anybody that had it it's usually kept us like a secret but it's like a secret nobody really talks about it nobody talks about any ailments and things like that so i, I kind of get your point there family around you know pe you know it's not something one culturally is not something that's really spoken about um so therefore people don't normally have as a, in, enough exposure and education around it from a cultural perspective and two as a young person you think um, if you're not as exposed to it, you start thinking it's an old person's disease. So therefore my age, how can I get yeah. cancer at the age of 38 you mentioned? So I come completely, I really resonates even with me as a, as a manager. Um, so yeah, sorry. I went yeah, into no, telling so, my story there, yeah. you know, where it was <laughs> about, so about you. It is so interesting that the, the, I was actually looking at the black women rising website earlier. Like I said, I've interviewed Leanne who set the, uh, who set it up, you know, quite a few times. Uh, but uh, but it says on there, on the kind of about section, that Leanne, one of the reasons that she wanted to set it up was because she wanted to, you know, sort of um, fight against that false narrative mm. uh, that cancer is not a black disease. You know, where where does that where does that kind of narrative come from, Pamela? Do you think? Well, it's it's a lot. It's it's, it's such a taboo subject, isn't it? Like cancer is related to death. If you have cancer, you die. 
that's but I also thought that as well when I got told you've got cancer first thing I thought who's going to look after my children and the crazy thing is I also went to that um, appointment by myself because I didn't even think that would be a possibility Um, so I wish I was more informed that yes we can fight cancer yes i'm still here i'm I'm in remission and um yeah where does it come from for me do you think in your in your experience that that perception that it's not a you know, black disease i think it comes from the fact that you know when you are i mean again if you think, if you think where i come from nigeria if you take it's not something that's often spoken about it's not something that is you know we don't have um back there we don't have the level of discussions the level of when i say the level of discussion some of the discussions is is through the awareness programs that we have in the united kingdom and in a lot of western countries we don't have that awareness program as such to my knowledge in um a lot of um in a, in a lot of african countries we don't have um that exposure to the discussions around cancer and the education around cancer in schools um and then of course when you're having conversations with the individuals again you know they they there are different depending on what aspect it goes back to what we're saying around you know dialects and languages and cultures even within one specific culture there are very different cultures various different cultures within that and some of these things are like um again like probably mentioned the taboo it's probably the right word to use it's not something that you know cancer no 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 where does that come from you know it's not something that we're used to whereas here there's a lot more education around cancer there is a lot more um there's a lot more there's a lot more detail around cancer that's being shared i mean you go into build you see billboards please if you see a cough you know if you see blood in your pee please make sure you go to your gp we don't have that in 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 some of these countries so i think i think that's where it comes from i think there are not that culture isn't a great thing is that in some cultures it's not just a spoken thing it's not you know and and in some third world countries or you know you you don't that's not the the focus um whereas here there's more recording there's more analysis around cancer so therefore you know, with all of the analysis, you know, X number of patients were diagnosed with cancer last year. We've got that level of detail. In in some countries, we don't have that level of detail. So therefore, if we can't yeah. see it, there's nothing we can do about it. So it's much more visible. Yeah. Yes. And yeah, my long-winded there's... way of saying visible. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and there's so much research around cancer in the Western world. Yeah. That, um, it, it, is, it is seen as a cure. Well, some of the cancers are seen as curable as back home that might not be completely the case as as i said if the word cancer is so associated with death that we don't talk about it at all so where did you go for your support then pamela so you you had this you know, this whirlwind day where you went in thinking everything will be fine i'll go on my own i'll probably be out in half an hour you know biopsies and, and mammograms and all sorts of things later you find out you, you do have breast cancer you know, how are you feeling and where do you, you know, where do you turn for your support? You know, if, if, as you say, you're, 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 you're not perhaps surrounded by people that want to have those difficult conversations. Um, yeah, everything was such a blur. I got given a lot of information, a lot of leaflets, um, a lot of information overload that I um, looked at, but I couldn't retain any information. Um the breast care nurse was very good in spotting that I was just blank. So she even um, suggested that even in the height of COVID restrictions, I was allowed to bring a friend to my appointment, which was really helpful because um, literally the next appointment, I was told that my tumor was that aggressive that I would need surgery in three weeks. Right. Wow. So I, I had no time to process anything. Um, so one of my friends went with me every time I had a, an appointment up towards my surgery. Um, as for family, um, my sister came and lived with me. She, she was my 
God sent. She lived with me for a whole year and helped me look after the kids and and myself. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's so, important though, isn't that? That's a good yeah. point. Like you laugh about that, but it, you know, that is important. You, you know, you spend, imagine like you tell me, but I imagine, I imagine all your, I mean, you said it before, I think your first thought was who's going to look after the kids. And actually maybe you, it's easy to forget you're looking after you uh, during a really difficult period. Yes. And it's, and I'm not the type of person that would really look after myself. I've been really neglecting myself in that part because my kids come first. And during my cancer journey, that has changed. I, I really look after myself now and I put, I put me first as well. You know, if I want to go on that holiday, I go on that holiday. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, it, it's a, it's a transition. That's for sure. But, um, so what treatment did you undergo? You had, you had surgery and then, and then how did it kind of pan out after that? So I had surgery and um, I'm not sure if you're aware. So when you have um, your tumour taken out, there's a possibility, they say there's a possibility that they'll have, they'll have to do a second incision. Yeah. So that's only 10% of patients that will fall under that bracket. So I was told not to worry because during the... Um, ultrasound it just showed that it was you, you caught it on time and uh, so I was hopeful that I will only have one surgery but unfortunately when I went back um, my surgeon that was lovely wasn't there he was on holiday so another surgeon broke the news to me that um, I needed a second incision but his approach and how he told me was full of he was he was not empathetic whatsoever just told me well you need a second incision because we found more cancer cells in your breast so you need another surgery so let's book an appointment and i'm just sitting there like what's, what's going what's going yeah. on here that's the, the complete whirlwind yes again i'm in complete shock and i said wait i give me give me a second to process this because he said, well, if you have any questions, I said, wait, I need to process this first because I've now been told that I need another surgery. What does that entail? Is it, is it spread or what does that mean? And that was the first time that I also felt like I had to kind of stand up for myself because if I would have said yes to having the second incision now, I wouldn't have been aware that it had spread to my lymph node right. because the that also got changed i had um radio, uh, i had um, chemotherapy first before my um after my second incision so i had chemotherapy which was 12 rounds and then after i had radiotherapy 21 rounds so fast forward a little bit how did you how did you come across black women rising and the work that leanne was doing so when I was going through chemotherapy, I felt really unheard, unseen, didn't really understand what I was going through myself because um, a, lo a lot of family, they don't really get what you're going through. Chemotherapy yeah. is very hard. What I wish they would have told me before going through chemotherapy is that not only is it a physical challenge, it's a very mental challenge as well. And you need to be prepared for that, for both. Because it's not only just losing your hair, it's it's your skin. Um, I had my skin peeling, my nails were black and they just fell off. And you think, well, this this is supposed to cure or yeah. get rid of the cancer when yeah. it's going to end. It's doing so much of the damage. Yes. And also, um, I went to one... Um, support group online and I didn't see anyone that looked like me and I felt that I wasn't I couldn't relate with anyone so I went I went on Google yeah. <laughs> and found Black Women Rising and uh, saw that they had an online support group for under 40s so I joined the support group and that changed my journey completely because the, the first session that I had I just saw so many different women that were going through the exact same emotions dealings with their surroundings dealings with the hospital they were going through very similar things that i was going through 
So that was such an eye opener and also gave me the courage to sometimes challenge things that I thought was not right. But then you feel like, well, he is the medical professional. He might be in the right. But, you know, it was it was very encouraging to be able to advocate for myself. It's massive, isn't it, Femi? Because, you know, we talk about cancer being very isolating, very lonely. I can't imagine you know, how much more lonely it is if you look around and you don't you don't see anybody who looks like you going through the same challenges and that's why you know um, a lot of the work that we talked about in the previous episodes uh, with you that you guys do with the alliance is you know really catering to those you know smaller communities that maybe have you know have the same you know, the same perception that cancer is not for them you know, they don't see themselves and it's I imagine that's a very lonely place I think it definitely is. I mean, we we find that even to get patients to come in to, you know, to raise the awareness of specific cancers in the areas that we are serving, it's so important to have conversations with those who can actually link us in far better with the communities that we're trying to engage with. So we usually link in with faith groups, we work with, because again, people, when things are familiar, to, and people can understand cultures and people can understand how to communicate certain things far better. It, it's not, the, the, the raising awareness is not a one size fits all kind of topic. It, it does need to be tailored. As Pamela mentioned, what's the first thing she went to go and do? She, she went to go and look for those that she felt could understand her better um if that's i'm not trying to paraphrase i'm paraphrasing not putting words in your mouth i hope family <laughs> you're here do correct me but you know it's 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 what a lot of people do sometimes you know you can if you can see that it's just that you know actually this could this could be me and this can i can probably get support here they understand my culture they understand my language they understand what i'm going through yeah. you know we've got similar experiences so it's huge it not just culturally it... sorry for me, not, it, uh, not just culturally i did i did the same after my after my first wife rachel died you know i went i went looking for people in my position who, mm. who you know who would get you know my you know, my particular circumstance and my particular yeah you know, and my emotions and what I was going through. And, and you don't turn to your friends necessarily, do you? You, you might do it as well, but they don't really understand. And, you know, why, why should they, they're not going through the same thing. Uh, so, you, you know, I think it, you know, broadening it out to just kind of cultural things, it is such a valuable thing for anybody going through, you know, whatever part of a cancer experience it is, to have that community of people around you that actually, you know, really gets every little bit, every little emotion, everything you're feeling, mm. every worry, every fear. Um, it's so important. Yeah. yeah. And I think that shared experience part also, it just, it, again, it's all part of that. Yeah. You know, on the, if someone can understand you better, then you're more likely to engage in that type of group or engage better. So Pamela, uh, let's just talk about Black Women Rising for a moment then, because um, as I said, you know, the wonderful Leanne Perro set it up a few years ago, I think after her own diagnosis, wasn't yeah. it? Uh, when she was going th- uh, through a very similar thing to what, you know, what you've described, she didn't, didn't see herself. You didn't feel like there was anywhere for her to uh, turn to for support. Uh, so she created this incredible community that's just grown and grown and grown, hasn't it? Yeah, it's 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 a it's a we're a big community now, and it's uh, it's like a sisterhood. Like every time I would go to to one of the the support groups, either if it's online or face to face, because we have the coffee mornings and the supper club, you just you just leave being uplifted, and you feel like you can you can get through this storm and come out positive. So it's it's amazing to have this support group. Also, the, the it, it also helps to have that conversation with family members or uh, your surroundings, and you feel more confident to also speak about it because a lot a lot of people that do um, join us, they feel like, well, I I didn't feel like I could talk about it. On you know, I I know this is my safe space where I can let it all out, but I now know how to approach the outside world, 
and explain to them what this this is. You know, a lot of the stuff that we've talked about, perceptions and a lot of the taboos, the, they're quite generational, aren't they? They come from your parents, your grandparents, great grandparents. You know, where are we still going wrong now? Where young black women, yeah, young black men are still are still affected by these perceptions and these taboos. Because there's, um, while we still have those taboos and distrust, um, um, no, while we still have this, there's still a distrust in the medical professional in profession, because we we still have a long way to go. For instance, um, when I went through radiotherapy, I got um, my tattoo alignments, the the tattoos to mark where they will put the radiation. Now I got told later after I had it done that I had freckles on my chest, so they can't find where they place the tattoo said well if i was told when i had the tattoo done that that would be an issue i would more than happily be able to you know make it bigger or even if you put it across because now i'm prone to having the radiation done inaccurately yeah and that distrust um doesn't help the taboo and the trust in medical professionals. So it's little things like that. Or for instance, when I had, um, uh, I had um, radiation burn and the radiation burn was black. It was completely black. My skin was really um, dry and it was bleeding. And when I called the helpline, they weren't able to help me because the information that she was, she was asking me was, Oh, is your is your skin gone pink? And I said, well, I don't think it will go pink because I am black. And she did not have an answer for that. So she said, well, you're probably fine. Just put some cream on it. But when I took a picture and sent it to my um, breast care nurse, she said, well, it looks like you, you might have an infection. So you need medication for that. So it's just that distrust and lack of education for our ethnic minority community where we're not we're not getting anywhere i think it goes back to it goes back to learning from stories like this you know stories like what pam not only learning when i say learning actively doing something sharing some of these stories and actually actively finding ways to change how we do things in how we do things um in these types of in these type of scenarios also though encouraging people to speak up and to again for us to capture some of these stories far better as well i mean it's it just we just got to keep talking keep learning and keep att- uh, you know showcasing what we're learning and and force the, the change that's required um to ensure that everybody feels secure everybody feels heard everybody feels um uh, that, that, that everyone feels that they can trust um the, the system that's currently in place to support them that sort of switch focus very slightly onto onto breast cancer obviously Pamela you, you had breast cancer you've talked about um saw some really interesting stat um breast cancer was the most common cancer type in northeast London 22 23 over 20 percent of all tumor types um and yet and we sort of touched on this last time breast screening uptake is only 61 percent in northeast London uh, the average for London across across the whole city is 60 percent whereas the average uh, nationally is 67. Uh, what do you think are the challenges and the barriers that are, are stopping people being diagnosed as early as they might be for breast cancer? Because the perception might be the breast cancer that it's it's one of the ones that we've got a handle on. You know, the majority of people probably understand, you know, the symptoms or some of the symptoms. You know, so what's contributing to this yeah, you know, there's high rate, particularly in uh, uh, this part of London, Femi. I, I, I think it's the, the it's a very diverse cultures that we have, and it's it's the engagement. It's it's really penetrating that communication piece with our communities that's crucial. And I think it's it goes back to what I was saying earlier on. It's not one size fits all. So it's learning what size fits and what works for this community and using that to raise the awareness so that people can come forward a lot earlier 
improve the education again even if we have to do more with schools again we know that we've got a, a diverse population so therefore the schools are going to be diverse uh, you know the pupils in the schools are going to be diverse so maybe we need to start with some of those educations there is is then linking into those that we can trust as well so as, as in sorry those that the community can trust again faith groups um local community uh, communities as well that you know community programs that are already in place is really trying to work through those i i, I just think that it, this shows again how important it is for us to try and you know really get over that line of engagement and i think engagement is crucial but again even in part parts of the communication that we use again some of our flyers do we need to make it more personable to 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 the communities and more targeted to the communities that we're working with so that they can also see that actually hold on a second there's someone that looks like me or or you know that's this this going through this or there are various different ways i do think that you know that engagement piece is such a crucial piece of work that we need to do to yeah. really break the barriers i mean that's one probably many things but but i think but that's probably a massive part of it isn't it pamela do you think that you know london is such a you know the most diverse city in the world probably isn't it mm. it has it has an extraordinary variety of cultures um you know different cultures different parts of london and you know are some of the taboos we've already talked about are they the reason why the um you know, the screening uptake is so low. I think that's one of the reasons about what Femi was saying, that um, working with the community, so they the best is to target the actual grassroots organisations that are in the community, because there are many flyers, but the flyers never really get to where they're supposed to be. And that, that's a major factor. Um, as for screening as well, I think especially with the ethnic minority group, we we are getting younger. So the age should be, I, I, I don't know, would be from maybe 30 or even from 25. They would, should start encouraging screening and having flyers with people of ethno, 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 ethnic minority background, which also be very beneficial. So there's there's so much that needs to be done to break those barriers. Steve, I also wanted to say as well, another thing that's crucial, I think, again, where we've got some of these mobile screening facilities, like mobile screening vans, again, where we place them is also important. I mean, we place them in places like Sainsbury's and some of these other places, which which I think help. But again, maybe we need to target more where, you know, target some of these other places where people can trust. Now, how we do that is something that I need to figure out. But, <laughs> um, you know, this is a Femi problem. But I need to figure out how we do that across North East London. But again, some of the, where we place some of these, where we place some of these units for screening alongside all of the efforts that we're doing to try and engage with communities is crucial. So I think I'd probably need to take a piece of work back to look at actually where are we having some of our screen back obviously breast screen is a little bit different uh, but with some of the other screenings as well where where do we have some of our facilities and how do we make it uh, something that's not perhaps a caricature of what you know some societies might think of it yeah it, it, do you think pamela obviously um you work you do a lot of work in this area now for black, uh, black women rising uh do you think that if you're if you were diagnosed now, do you think your experience would be any different uh, to how it was when you were diagnosed, you know, three or four years ago? Um, it, I think. Are we getting better? Someone, is what I'm going to say. Are we like? Is the work, you know, is the work going still, on working? Yeah, we still have a lot to do. We still have a lot to do. Um, it's still apparent the inequality in in the healthcare system. Um, for instance, prosthesis. There's no skin to skin to procedures available nationwide for the NHS. Um, it's only available at the hospital that I went, and I cannot imagine. I had a lumpectomy, but I can't imagine someone having a mastectomy and waking up with a different skin tone prosthesis. Yeah. So things like that still in 2024 is not happening. Um, wig, when I um was offered a wig during the wig service. It, the only wigs that were available were synthetic wigs were for absolutely not women of color. So yeah. that's 
in most hospitals still not available. I know in, in London, some are available over there, but for instance, if you just, if you're outside London, that's not there. So there's still a lot of work that needs to be done to make the service and the, the, the level of service in the, in the NHS better for um, when you go through your cancer journey. Yeah, I, I think the part I missed out earlier on, and I think I've said it broadly, which is education. And I said education through learning from patient stories. But actually, there is a massive education piece that needs to be done, I feel, in very diverse areas. Like if we take North East London as a prime example, actually, that shouldn't be, like you said, something that happens in 2024. It shouldn't be something that happens in this day and age. So learning to also work with various different um ethnic groups is something that we probably need to ensure that we we have um as a as a as a key um area of work um within hospitals as well so i think as a cancer alliance we probably need to promote some of that and we've got the stats we've got the numbers we know the numbers um by ethnicity of patients going in we know the numbers diagnosed by we've got all of that detail so actually what we can do is that we've got an argument to state here that actually if we want to if we really want to improve the patient's pathway and the patient's experience some of the key because that's what it is isn't it a lot of this as well is also your experience that also doesn't enable trust you know if you're going in somewhere you're seeing a different color prosthesis if you're seeing the, the, all of this type of things that doesn't really help um so it, it is there's an element of educate educating um, and we need to find the best ways of doing that by working with clinical teams by working with patient groups to just try and find the best ways of doing that again having a wig that isn't you know having the, the, is a standard wig is it's not one size fits all i mean that in itself yeah. causes trauma on a, on a very kind of difficult pathway for yourself as it is anyways is there an education piece as well for people working in it in the nhs because it strikes mm -hmm. me that you know making sure that you know, the right color prosthesis are available is a reasonably easy fix i would have I would have thought. No, I completely, completely agree with that. And I think that's, again, like, it, that's where that piece of, that, that education piece does come in. You, we do need to do that because that shouldn't be happening in this day and age. And as a cancer alliance, and cancer alliances across, the, you know, the other 21 cancer, the other 20 cancer alliances in the country, I'm sure, you know, hearing something like this, these are some of the things that we can do to try and improve patient experience, which is working to ensure that we, we can cater for all groups yeah well i think it's massively important that people like pamela keep telling their stories isn't it absolutely keep yeah. kind of showing up these little well not little littles they're not little at all these 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 glaring emissions these these big holes and these yeah, these challenges i think it's so important so pamela thank you so much for coming on and uh, telling us your story it's been really enlightening Thank you for having me. Thank you, Pamela. Thank you.